Uh, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am enormously honored and just delighted to have uh, Andrew McLuhan here from the McLuhan Institute. Um, he's the grandson of Marshall McLuhan. We've been studying Marshall McLuhan and Andrew is here to tell, him, tell us his version of evolution of Marshall McLuhan's idea. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much, Srikant. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to give you, as you said, my version uh, of part of the story. Wonderful. So what, what we are looking at kind of the, is intellectual history of how the ideas developed. So what, where, where do you think we should start? I think we should start with the birth, where, where, where he grew up, you know, what kind of context he grew up in. Um, well, here's the thing, the, the McLuhan galaxy, if you will, is vast, it's huge. Um, we can only hope to cover a little bit in this short time. Honestly, I've been at this for 10 years or so in, in earnest, part-time, part um, aside from growing up in it, and I'm still finding my feet. So um, <laughs> there, I may be an expert on some parts of it, uh, but I'm certainly not the expert. So, uh, and I don't think there is anybody alive who could be the expert, you know. Um, Marshall was, was a one of the kind, one of a kind kind of person. Um, I, I do a fair bit of teaching and talking about Marshall and, and my dad's work and where possible, I like to use, uh, I always prefer primary sources mm -hmm. um, because you know the further you get away, the further things get diluted. And um, I'd rather we all make our own mistakes than rely on anybody else's. So um, <laughs> uh, I have something here. Uh, this, I found a file here around the office simply labeled autobiography one day. Hmm. Um, and this, I'm in Eric McLuhan's library, which uh, I inherited. Um, and my, my wife and I bought this, bought my parents' property last year. So this is mine now, I live here. Hmm. Um, and I found this file, it simply said autobiography. I haven't been able to quite accurately date it, but I figure it comes from the late 60s, early 1970s, and it's very short. Mm -hmm. um, so let me, let me, let's have Marshall McLuhan give you his autobiography, okay? Wonderful, wonderful. He starts. The advantage of being born a Westerner is partly the unimpeded view that it provides a more densely settled area. A Canadian enjoys somewhat the same advantage in relation to the United States or to Europe. Canada is a kind of cultural due line, due meaning distant early warning, if you haven't come across mm -hmm. that yet. We'll come back to that later. Uh, a kind of cultural counter environment. A counter environment affords opportunities of observation such are as normal to the outsider. A habit of pattern recognition and even of abstract theorizing grows on the outsider, especially if he doesn't feel any anxious need of psychological support from his contemporaries. Apart from having spent my first few years on the windy plains of Alberta, the most formative factor must have been a year of early childhood spent on the Bay of Fundy, that's the east coast of Canada. The scent and action of the sea has permeated my being ever since. It was therefore a grievous shock when I discovered on the cattle boat en route to Great Britain that I was a very poor sailor. Now, just to digress for a second, um, Marshall first attended the University of Manitoba. Um, he actually started in engineering for the first year before switching to English literature. Um, and after University of Manitoba, he won a scholarship to Cambridge However, this was in the height of the depression and they didn't have any money. So he and his friend, Tom Easterbrook made their way to the East coast of Canada and worked their passage over to England with their bicycles on a cattle boat. Uh, and as you can imagine, crossing the Atlantic ocean, uh, shoveling up after cattle was not a pleasant experience. Anyway, this, this destroyed a lot of Marshall's romantic notions of what being a sailor meant. <laughs> and that's what he's referring to here. Yeah. So he says, my studies at Cambridge produced many unexpected advantages. Not the least of those was the excitement of encountering many world figures. Seen at a great distance, famous people acquire a quite unreal and discouraging character. Seen close up, 
the quite human limitations and foibles of such people can be the greatest possible stimulus to self-assertion. The cult of greatness can be a very debilitating and inhibiting thing when developed in remoteness from its public. Another advantage that Cambridge conferred on me was its bland acceptance of the contemporary world as a scene to be understood and controlled. Cambridge has never had a predominantly commercial setting. It has never been involved in the commerce of its time. This seems to have absolved it from the need to oppose the age. A great deal of valuable energy can be expended in building up moral defenses against one's time. This same energy could be more usefully spent in seeking to discover the shape and tendencies of the age. For whatever reason, Cambridge has always been rich in minds that seized upon the patterns of their period in order to foster its best possibilities. I was fortunate to counter men like I.A. Richards and F.R. Levis. It has been said that the job of the teacher is to save the student's time. At Cambridge, there were men who knew how to do this by putting a student in touch with his time. Much life and energy is wasted in perceptual alienation from one's age. There's so much goodness in wow. just this short two page wow. thing. The training of perception has been the aim and boast of many educators at Cambridge in this century. Upon leaving Cambridge in 1936, I spent my first teaching job at the University of Wisconsin, an ideal spot for a Canadian to begin his acquaintance with the USA. It was there at Madison that I was received into the Catholic Church in 1937. Quote, style is a way of seeing, end quote, said Flaubert. And since Flaubert, art and literature have consciously assumed the task of probing our new technological environments. Art and literature have revealed the characters of the new environments created by technologies by setting up counter environments. It has been my study of contemporary poetry and painting that has drawn me to examine the new human environments wrought by the physical extensions of our own human body. It is the artists and poets who have taught me that the emperor's new clothes are not visible without the aid of art. Man without art, to use the phrase of Wyndham Lewis, are engaged in hypnotized contemplation of the emperor's old clothes. During the past century, art has revealed that the changing environment is not perceptible to unaided human attention. Throughout all human time, men have been engaged in conscious awareness of the preceding environment, which presents itself as a nostalgic art form. The current environment creates an overload of sensation that obliterates pattern and form. My study of literature became an aid to the perception that led me to undertake the task of understanding the relation between culture and technology. I had begun my university studies as a student of engineering because of my interest in structure and design. It becomes more clear each day that structure and design in all levels of human organization are becoming orchestral. Our new electric age no longer presents any specialized cultural gradient. Ours is the age of the zero gradient in which all times and cultures are in a continuous dialogue. To be a participant in this dialogue is most satisfying. Finally, when I was studying the work of the Elizabethan Thomas Nash at the Huntington Library, I met Corinne Lewis of Fort Worth, Texas, who was studying at the Pasadena Playhouse. We were married in 1939 and now have six children, the eldest and youngest of whom are boys. By way of participating in the dialogue of this time, I find the open perception of all these teenage boys and girls a very rich means of keeping in touch with our time. Marshall McLuhan. Oh, I can't hear you, Shrikant. Sorry. Wow, that was that was amazing. This is a just just blockbuster start. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Him him himself talking about this. 
This is great. So is this something that is published out there or this is still in manuscript form? No, um, I published it. Um, this was the first publication of the McLuhan Institute. Um, it's uh, I got a little a little photo wow. um, previously yeah. unpublished photo and there's uh, the imprint. Wow. I did it with a, a local publishing house here, Invisible Press. Very nice. um, if anybody wants one, um, do I have? I actually don't have it listed online. Um, oh. But uh, if you email me, Andrew at the McLuhan Institute dot com, I think I charge ten bucks plus shipping for them. Sure, perfect, perfect. I, I will go ahead and uh, Joe. Could you put in the email address in there, uh, Andrew at McLuhan Institute? Dot com. Appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks, my friend. It's um, the, the McLuhan Institute. Oh, the, the, yeah, the, the McLuhan. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So we started out. Uh, so he started out in Canadian Prairie. And then there is the there is Cambridge. So so let me just spend a couple of minutes on the Canadian Prairie. Yeah. What do you think that he got from the fact that he grew up there? So he was born in Edmonton, Alberta, which is a little further west. And uh, when he was only a couple of years old, they moved uh, to Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. They moved there for a few reasons. One of them was um, his mother, Elsie, uh, say, I don't know what you've covered yet, but um, Elsie was an elocutionist. Mm -hmm. And this was this is very important to Marshall's upbringing because uh, she was basically uh, a performer. Um, as an elocutionist, she delivered monologues and uh, plays. She delivered plays where she would um, do all the parts herself. So she was extremely um, proficient in acting and taking on different roles, like simultaneously. It, you, you can only imagine um, the kind of discipline and uh, that that takes. So, um, so she did this, and she gave performances in you know church banquet halls and theaters and whatever else. Moving to Winnipeg, uh, Winnipeg was uh, at the time uh, one of the cultural hubs of Canada um, and being very close to St. Paul, Minnesota, um, which was also big at that time. Winnipeg was a, a rail hub and that meant something a hundred years ago, <laughs> mm -hmm. where not so much today. So being in Winnipeg afforded a lot more opportunities uh, for the whole family, really, but especially for Elsie. Um, it's important to note Elsie uh, and the effect that would have had on Marshall, um, because Marshall grew up uh, around that kind of environment and learning those kind of skills. And um, a shrewd person can easily uh, see that in Marshall's work, you know, his performative side and how he comes by it honestly, as we say, having grown up the son of an elocutionist. Um, so, so the prairies, you know, he talks about um, how the, the Western, the plains mentality with the wide, uh, the wide vistas and, you know, the sunset that lasts seems to go on forever, how that afforded him a similar uh, metaphorically wide view into, into things and, um, the other, the other thing about Winnipeg is that it's uh, at the confluence of two rivers. Mm -hmm. So um, while it was a rail hub, it started out as a trading post because of its waterways. Mm -hmm. um, and that was important to Marshall because, as he said, he liked to sail. So he built a sailboat um, mm -hmm. and he would sail on the, on the Assiniboine and the Red River. Uh, and that would be important to him as well. And then when it came time to go to university, the University of Manitoba was right there. So... Um, so it all it all worked out. Wonderful. Um, so from the Western, he goes to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. That's that's a huge leap. And so what happens at Cambridge, you know, and, and it looks like he takes in everything at that time. You know, he's like, you know, I, I read the um, I think, um, you know, uh, Mark uh, Stallman published this. Um, essay, I think, uh, during the centenary uh, on history of um, intellectual development of uh, Marshall McLuhan. And he talks about how he took in everything that was going on at that time. So what, what, do you, what role do you think Cambridge played in his life? Um, a, a huge role. And um, 
let's let Marshall speak for himself again. Sure. Um, there are, I, I mentioned before, I think before we really started that there are many McLuhan's. That was actually the title of a conference uh, in 2019 in New York City that I was a part of. Uh, I delivered a speech called uh, Enter Through the Bookshop, McLuhan Monographiti, mm -hmm. um, which is a nod to uh, Banksy in his film Exit Through the Bookshop, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, and Exit Through the Gift Shop. Um, and I've done a lot of work with Marshall's annotations and anyway, graffiti writing on the wall, writing on the page. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this many McLuhan's thing um, is a nod to the different Marshall McLuhan's that are out there. They can be, um, they can be broken down into two major categories, I think. And the one is the literary Marshall McLuhan mm -hmm. and the other is the technological critic criticism, mm -hmm. uh, culture and technology, that Marsha McLuhan. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it breaks down into two camps, people who want um, the McLuhan of the medium is the massage and Fiore and Agle and Annie Hall. And then others who, um, you know, insist you can't know anything about Marshall unless you know the literary side, which is actually very true. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, life is short. And if you only have one avenue, I say, go for it. Um, Meantime, there's this book, The Literary Criticism of Marsha McLuhan, The Interior mm -hmm. Landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and this was uh, put out by Eugene McNamara. Um, it's Literary Criticism of Marsha McLuhan, 1943 to 1962. Um, and this is full of Marshall's uh, book reviews, literary criticism. You have to remember that um, from the beginning to the end of his career, Marshall taught English literature. Mm -hmm. Even as everything was going on with culture and technology, um, Marshall was still teaching at the University of Toronto, a suite of classes on, he was an expert in modernist poetry mm -hmm. uh, and English literature. So that was always there happening. And um, it's great to look at these essays and you know book reviews, which are mostly masquerading as ways to talk about his own thinking, kind of built off the back mm -hmm. of these other book reviews. But um, Marshall writes uh, the, the foreword of this book, um, and, and I'll read just the last couple paragraphs here. Please. He says, my study of media began and remains rooted in the work of these men. Thomas Nash was a Cambridge pet in my terms there. Um, so while Nash might be an obscure Elizabethan pamphleteer to us today, mm -hmm. at the time, early 19 early 20th century at Cambridge, he was a big deal. People knew who he was. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to take, I always remind uh, my students when we're reading Understanding Media that this is a book that was written between 19, well, kind of 1958 and 1964. So um, things were a little different then. And uh, the topics, the people that he mentions were more au courant in the 60s. Mm -hmm. even if they're obscure now. So uh, Thomas Nash was a Cambridge pet in my terms there. I did my doctoral study on him, approaching him via the process of verbal training from the Sophists through Cicero and Augustine and Dante to the Renaissance. When Joyce quipped to a critic, some of my puns are trivial and some are quadrivial, he was being as always precise. Mm -hmm. When my critics imagine I'm being vaguely metaphorical, I too am trying to be literal and mm -hmm. precise. Mm -hmm. Marshall's always playing with yeah. you, you yes. know, just yes. as he's playing with language mm -hmm. is his method. Mm -hmm. That art is a means of giving us new awareness through an inter intensification of our sensory life is obvious. TV Guide for June 8 to 14, 1968 has a painting by Dali on the cover two thumbs exhibit two TV screens as thumbnails. That is pure poetry, acute new perception. Dolly immediately presents the fact that TV is a tactile mode of perception. Touch is the space of the interval, not a visual connection. I've been trying to elucidate that fact for years in vain. The somnambulist knows better. Can't he see TV with his eyes? How could it be tactile? Pasteur was thrown out of the medical profession because he insisted that doctors wash their hands before surgery. They knew better. They could see their hands were clean. 
the effects of new media on our sensory lives are similar to the effects of new poetry. They change not our thoughts, but the structure of our world. All this is merely to say that my juvenile devotion to romantic poetry is closely related to my present concern with the effects of the media in our personal and political lives. Um, I had wanted to say, uh, all right, here it is. Sorry, I should have started a paragraph earlier. After a conventional and devoted initiation to poetry as a romantic rebellion against mechanical industry and bureaucratic stupidity, Cambridge was a shock. <laughs> Richards, Levis, Elliot, and Pound and Joyce in a few weeks opened the doors of perception on the poetic process and its role in adjusting the reader to the contemporary world. And that's really the critical part of this piece. Sorry that I forgot to mention it, but uh, that was the point was that um, Marshall was coming. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that Marshall had already earned a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from the University of Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And he got accepted to Cambridge, but they didn't recognize his degrees. Mm -hmm. They made him get a second bachelor's degree and a second master's degree at Cambridge before they would let him go on to his PhD project. So um, can you imagine? Wow. Anyway. So how long was he at Cambridge? I mean, he was at Cambridge. He did them really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was like 32 to 34 mm -hmm. uh, or 35 uh, to knock out the new master uh, bachelors and masters. Mm -hmm. And then he would, he would spend quite a bit, quite a lot longer before he finally finished uh, the doctorate, which um, if you've looked at it, um, that's more books than I'm likely to read in my lifetime. Yes. That he, like the amount of reading Marshall did, Let's talk about this for a second because it's incredible. He, it's it's crazy, and and I I, I get this a little bit of FOMO, you know, being in this library because here I am surrounded by six thousand books with little hope of reading them all in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, yet they're here, and um, it depends how deeply you want to get into McLuhan work, right? Um, you can get you can get a lot out of it with with very little, you know, um, spend, dedicate yourself to, to going through something like understanding media slowly and carefully and allowing it time to work and to breathe and looking up the references. And you can get a lot there, or you can read every book that he cites in all his works, the thousands and thousands of books that he read, um, and go a lot deeper. But, um, I think there are, there are different levels of engagement and even a, a light level of engagement can be uh, kind of, can be rewarding. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, I was looking at his dissertation, Trivium. So yeah. why, why <laughs> Trivium? Well, um, and I'm not an expert on the Trivium. I've read it through once and it's it's tough going it's probably the most difficult thing i've tried to read it's ridiculous um it's half or more footnotes you know um but as marshall said he started he did his he ostensibly did his dissertation on thomas nash um but it quickly turned into something bigger because he realized there was something happening there um and that was uh what he saw as a war between the parts of the trivium. Um, and this is what he kind of documents. And those parts of the trivium, three of the seven liberal arts, um, dialectic, grammar, and rhetoric. Um, and he saw this more as an opposition between uh, dialectic and rhetoric and grammar, um, a, a battle between you know, logic um, or you know, point of view and rationality and everything and, and sort of wider areas of study. And he traces it um, up to the time of, of the of the early, what is it, early 20th century. Sure. Let me interrupt. Uh, for people who are not familiar with the trivium, what is it that grammar on rhetoric on one side have in common? Mm -hmm. And what is it that 
um, dialectic has? Well, uh, you know, this is, I, I haven't been classically trained to that extent, but uh, from what I understand, um, so rhetoric is all about uh, the art of speaking, of communication, of persuasion. Uh, and uh, actually Marshall's mother, an elocutionist, the term comes from rhetoric. Uh, it's one of the five parts of rhetoric is elocutio or delivery. Um, and uh, grammar is devoted to etymology. Um, it's uh, the two books, the book of nature and the book of man, as it, it was called. Um, so it's about etymology and interpretation, exegesis, uh, where yeah, rhetoric is about um, the, organi the presentation of knowledge uh, for effect. Um, and dialectic is about logic and philosophy. Um, it's about the organization of knowledge. Um, uh, that's at least how I understand the trivium. So why, why did he think that there is a battle between these two? <laughs> uh, well, I think that's, that's kind of the, the substance of the book, mm -hmm. uh, of the thesis. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, I'm not qualified to comment on it. It's, uh, I need to read it a few more times before I really get a handle on it. But this was a this was this is a core part of how he's thinking, right? That 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 grammar and rhetoric is kind of looking at deep patterns in life itself and trying to remain true to that. Whereas dialectic is like a tool for analyzing and comparing kind of smaller things. So I mean, one one of the things that he sees, he you know makes a distinction between ancients and moderns ancients kind of really being rooted in grammar and rhetoric and the moderns kind of being overwhelmingly focused on dialectics to the neglect of uh, grammar and rhetoric. Does that, does that sound about right? Uh, I think so. And Marshall um, wrote more about it. He, he wrote more about the ancients uh, versus moderns thing um, but again, it's not something I've had the opportunity to go too deeply into. Sure, sure. So um, there, there were kind of people in uh, Cambridge, like, um, not in Cambridge, but at London at that time, because see, it's very interesting because he has a very unique approach. He very deeply connects with the present culture, but he brings to bear his entire kind of philosophical, historical knowledge to bear on that one point. Yeah. So even when he's talking about literary criticism, he's saying, I'm talking about this thing, but he's bringing in every large context to bear on that. Is that a fair way of describing what he's doing? I'd say so. And um, this was kind of his, his genius uh, was how he was able to connect these dots that nobody else saw connections in. Um, and the crazy thing is that it all tracks back to Cambridge and to literary criticism, um, <laughs> to, the, to the things he, he learned there, um, in particular studying with Richards and Levis and this, uh, this thing called practical criticism. Um, because practical criticism was, uh, so it was all the rage when he showed up at Cambridge. Uh, the book had come out a couple of years before. Um, and what pra this was um, looking for new ways of criticizing, of criticism of literature. And um, what they were trying to do, uh, Richards and Levis, was they were trying to figure out what makes a poem good, <laughs> you know, objectively. Um, and so one way they, they tried to figure that out was they took uh, a series of poems, a mixture of um, stuff by notable people and stuff, you know, by people who weren't known and stuff that was arguably great or not so great. And they tried to select, if it was well-known poets, they tried to select things that weren't as well-known from them. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they basically, it was like a blind test. So they took away the identifying information of the authors and they handed out these poems 
um, to students and to, uh, but mind you, their students were graduate students and they were already supposed to be, to know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and they were trying to find out what criteria, what makes a poem good. So they were looking for consensus. And the crazy thing was that the answers they got back from people were all over the place and nobody could seem to agree on, for one thing, whether any given poem was good or not, but also why it was good or not. Um, and this, this was very controversial at the time. Uh, it turns out that uh, a poem was good because it was agreed that it was good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not very helpful. Uh, really, when you're trying to evaluate something, you know, it's just a popularity contest and, you know, that's fine. But what does this have to do with anything? But so you so Marshall kind of turned um, these approaches to literary criticism um, onto different subjects. So I said, well, what if we applied these techniques? What if we looked at um, not whether this thing was good or bad, but tried to figure out what it does, how it operates mm -hmm. um, without those kind of considerations? And maybe we can look at comics mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we can look at technology, you know? Um, and the reason he started doing it was because he showed up at the States and he, he, he realized that he had no idea what his students were on about, where they were coming from. It was culture shock coming back from Cambridge. Um, I mean, going from Canada to Cambridge was culture shock. And then going from Cambridge to the US uh, in the 40s was another culture shock. So he decided, he basically used them as guinea pigs to, to start thinking about these things. Um, and a lot of that turned into what was published as The Mechanical Bride, uh, The Folklore of Industrial Man. Um, so um, maybe this is a good time. Um, have you seen this book, Theories of Communication? No, I have not. That's uh, new yeah. to me. I Yeah, please tell okay. me. Um, theories of Communication. Here, uh, Dad put this out in 2011. This is published with Peter Lang, New York, 2011, Theories of Communication. And it's a, a collection of essays by Marshall and Eric McLuhan. And it begins, a fundamental principle of this book is that communication entails change. The sine qua non of communication, therefore, is the matter of effect. If there's no effect, if there's no change in the audience, there is no communication. The approach is rhetoric to the core. Wow. Yeah, so that's, that's tipping off the, the rhetoric thing. Mm -hmm. um, so Marshall's preoccupation in all of these things is the matter of effect in what these things do, right? Mm -hmm. And in theories of communication, Marshall came up with this, um, this, I guess, kind of game that he played with himself was he was always looking for what uh, this author or this artist or this person's theory of communication was. And it was a formula. The formula runs like this. The author's intended audience mm -hmm. plus their intended effect equals their theory of communication. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in my father's and in Marshall's library looking at their marginalia. And um, for example, I have here uh, a Marshall, one of Marshall's copy of Ezra Pound's ABC of Reading. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's, it's full of... Here, uh, all the end notes here, right, in wow. Marshall's handwriting. Okay, um, so he'll he's always looking out for familiar themes, thing like uh, the medium is the message or global village or things like that. Um, but he also flags T O C a lot, and that stands for theory of communication. So whenever um, in his reading he finds uh, an allusion, a reference to this writer's intended audience or intended effect he flags that for theory of communication. So um, Marshall, uh, Marshall had proposed this uh, world communication series on theories of communication. Um, I forget to what publisher, but it never got picked up. Um, and, uh, you know, after Marshall died in the, in the last couple decades of his life, dad was kind of, my dad, Eric, was kind of in a, a mopping up operation Mm -hmm. uh, tying up a lot of loose ends. Media and formal cause was a loose end left by Marshall. Mm -hmm. Theories of communication was another loose end. So Eric put together a lot of these essays on various people's uh, theory of communication, and it covers um, Harold Innes, Aristotle, Cicero, 
um, Joyce, Pound, like all the all the big ones are in here. Um, what's also in here in chapter 16 is Marshall McLuhan's theory of communication by Eric McLuhan. And that's a really valuable essay. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of it here because I think it's it's please very please as much as you as much as you want. I'm just okay. all ears. Okay, <laughs> that sounds uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, whenever provoked, Marshall McLuhan would declare, "Look, I don't have a theory of communication. I don't use theories. I just watch what people do, what you do, or words to that effect." That's the short answer to our question, what is Marshall McLuhan's theory of communication? Perhaps I should end the chapter here. The long answer follows. Um, so he continues, as he often said, Marshall McLuhan did not have a theory of communication. Of course, he did have definite notions about what constituted communication and what did not. He insisted regularly though, that he didn't have a theory of communication, that he didn't use theories in his work, Instead, he would aver he used observation, he used probes. It's a matter of how you begin. If you begin with theory, then one way or another, your research winds up geared to making the case for or against the truth of that theory. Begin with theory, you begin with the answer. Begin with observation, you begin with the questions. A theory always becomes a scientific point of view and a way of seeing the job at hand. Begin with observation and your task is to look at things and to look at what happens, to see. That necessitates detachment and training of critical awareness. Uh, he continues, when Marshall insisted that he didn't use theories, he meant that he didn't use them the way that people expect theories to be used. Quote, I don't have a theory of communication means I don't work in the way of normal science. I don't start with a theory to prove or disprove or submit to the torturers. I start with and stick with observation. He cared less for ideas about actuality than he cared for actuality itself. The stance is also quite consistent with Francis Bacon's insistence on observation. Both men were committed empiricists. At Cambridge and later, he found much to admire in Bacon's work. Observation necessitates using all points of view at once. This, um, and the essay continues, and it's, uh, it's really worth looking at. Um, but this is what it comes down to. Um, and Marshall talked about it in his biography about Cambridge being a place which trained perception. Um, and that's what Marshall was always trying to do. Um, and this was the distinction why he, he rejected this scientific read dialectic point of view is that he says, you know, a, a point of view is, is really narrow and it's not helpful in understanding an ecological situation, which is a, an environment, you know, an environment is a total thing and a point of view is not going to get you too far. So he was always um, trying to expand his uh, perception and awareness. Another thing he mentioned in that autobiography um, at the very end there, and it sounded frivolous at, at first hearing, but it's not. He said, I find the open perception of all these teenage boys and girls a very rich means of keeping in touch with our time. You know, Marshall was, if anything, he was pathological about keeping his perceptions as wide as possible. Mm -hmm. One of the ways he did this was by studying language. And, um, you know, languages aren't, aren't static things they're constantly evolving and they evolve out of necessity. We change our language because the situation changes and we need to find ways of describing, of coping with it, right? Mm -hmm. So Marshall was always listening to how people used words and phrases and how that changed because that signaled changes in the, in the environment, which meant technological changes, which meant people change, right? And these were clues into the nature of that change. So um, another way that Marshall kept his perceptions open was uh, in his reading habits. You know, um, Marshall started every day reading his Bible, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he didn't just read one Bible. He had several copies. And what he would do is whenever he was traveling, um, if he was traveling in Spain, uh, he'd check the, you know, the drawer beside the bed 
and there's a Gideon's Bible in Spanish, right? Spanish on one page, often English on another. Um, or, you know, if he was in France, there'd be a French Bible. The, the great thing about the Bible is that they are fanatical about consistency of translation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a great it's a great way to learn languages because um, if you know if you know the content uh, in your language, it makes it pretty much easier to pick up the other languages. Um, and you know every every culture, every language is a different way of experiencing things and a different way of telling you about it. So this was one way that Marshall kept his perceptions open um, because you know our languages are our earliest colonizers. Uh, the ones that we never recover from. Um, so not just slang, but but different languages is is one way that Marshall kept his perception open. And when um, when all else failed, there was always the artist to fall back on. Sorry, I, I missed the last. Uh, it was all, always what to fall back upon. Oh, the artist. Artist. Yes. Okay. All right, uh, Andrew. This is just incredible. Okay, I don't know where to where to begin. This is very deep. Okay. okay. Um, so we're saying several things uh, here. So one, he's saying, start with observations. Always start with observations mm -hmm. and keep that. It's not like a one-time thing. You just keep your senses open and keep taking in things. That's one thing he's saying. Yeah. Second, he's saying is that language is a crucial tool to be able to do that because you're you know, that, that, that's your means for doing that. Um, but let me ask you one question. The theory, so we, I want to ask you about Marshall McLuhan's theory of communication. Sure. We said that theory of communication has two parts. One yeah. is intended audience and uh -huh. second is intended if, uh, effect. Yeah. Who is the intended audience of Marshall McLuhan? It's a great question. Um, another great resource is uh, uh, a work called Letters of Marshall McLuhan that was uh, collected and edited by um, Marshall's wife, Corinne, his longtime agent, Mady Molinero, and uh, William Toy, Bill Toy. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the, the volume that was published was supposed to be volume one. Um, because Marshall had a huge correspondence and um, his letters are so revealing. Um, it, he corresponded with Ezra Pound. And, uh, and I think it was 1951, he wrote to Ezra Pound that he's trying to needle the somnambulists. Um, and that's a theory of commun communication statement. And what he's trying to do uh, is he's trying to wake people up. You know, mm -hmm. Finnegan's wake, right? Mm -hmm. So um, he had a very broad intended audience. Uh, he was trying to reach everybody, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, and awaken us from, from this technological slumber where um, you know, we're not paying attention to the present, but um, constantly um, living a generation back. And his own work is, is kind of a testament to this. Um, he said, I'm very careful to only predict things which already happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't consider himself a prophet, but somebody who studied the present. And uh, my dad said, you know, Marshall wasn't ahead of his time. He was ahead of his contemporaries. Okay. And so the implication is that Marshall wasn't predicting the future so much as describing the present. And he came to these descriptions largely from studying um, his environment, aiding, being aided a lot by artists. The thing that, that gets me is that, because people say, oh man, yeah, the medium is the message and global village he was talking about today. I, I can see it today, right? All these things he was talking about. But Marshall was talking about 1960. He was talking about 1970. Um, and if he was describing his present and we see it as our present, what's happening today? You know, mm -hmm. uh, 50, 60 years later, this, if you think about it, can keep you up at night. Mm 
uh, and this to me. So this is what Marshall was trying to do. He's trying to to break this cycle whereby we we live a generation back because, you know, Marshall saw that uh, we're, you know, speech or maybe earlier kind of got a ball rolling and the ball has been picking up speed and going faster and faster. Um, and this is a mixed blessing because, um, you know, he said information overload yields to pattern recognition. So it's a function of this speed that where change happens so fast that we don't have time to adjust, which means we have the opportunity to, uh, to perceive and to understand. So that's great. On the other hand, we're living <laughs> in this incredible speed up time when we don't have the time to adjust or any skills to adjust, right? Uh, so it's a mixed blessing. As somebody who said, if they only raised the temperature of the bathwater half a degree an hour, we wouldn't know when to scream, mm. you know? But here, almost monthly, we're dropped into a fresh boiling pot of water, you know? Certainly this has been driven home in the last year with COVID and the technological acceleration that's come as a result of this. But so Marshall saw opportunities and um, he brought up Edgar Allan Poe a lot. And uh, Edgar Allan Poe um, was a hero of his. Uh, Marshall would often bring up this story, The Descent into the Maelstrom. And uh, this was a great analogy because in the story, uh, the sailor and his brother uh, they're fishermen and they're they're out fishing and, and where they where they are on the ocean there's this giant maelstrom and everybody knows about it you avoid it and you're fine but you know they were onto a school of fish or whatever and before they realized it they're sucked into the maelstrom while his brother loses his stuff and hops overboard but the sailor um, being disposed to find entertainment and stuff it's a giant maelstrom so you know, they're, they're going around and around and around. And once the initial terror wears off a little bit, the sailor starts to pay attention to what's happening. And, you know, for fun, out of his own amusement, as he says, he looks at the various relative speeds of objects and how fast they're going down. And as a result of this, he noticed that certain objects are actually going up out of the vortex, out of the maelstrom. Hmm. I thought, this is interesting. And eventually he realizes that there's a pattern to it and um, he identifies an upcoming object and he jumps overboard and latches onto it and he makes his way out of the maelstrom and survives. Wow. And Marshall saw this as an example of hope for us, for our technological circumstance, that if um, we're willing to, um, he said, you know, there's, no inevitability as long as there's a willingness to contemplate the situation. So he felt that, um, you know, we design these technologies, we, we get ourselves into these messes. Um, he also said, we can think things out before we put them out. This is the idea of media ecology, which mm -hmm. is not just about studies, it's about improving your environment, right? As mm -hmm. much as environmental activism is about um, reducing pollution so that we can all breathe. Well, there's a, a precise mapping of that uh, from natural ecology to media ecology. So this was Marshall's end game. He was trying to wake us up um, so that we took a bit of uh, control technologically, um, you know, for everybody's benefit, essentially. Wow. Sorry, did I get on a soapbox? Wow. No, this is beautiful. Uh, Andrew, this is incredible. So let me summarize it. So his theory of communication is that he is, his intended audience is everybody. And the effect that he's trying to do is to wake us up. And uh, so that, that's beautiful. Um, now, the question is, why is it that people are asleep? And what, what, is, what is it that ends up waking it up, waking them up? I mean, one of the things that I see in his writing again and again is that he makes this distinction between left brain sequential kind of processing where you are using what is already there and you're taking the next step. So in that sense, you are not really aware of what is going on around you versus what he says that he's a right brain person who is trying to do pattern recognition, but he's looking and saying, what is going on? 
And that, so I see that as being the contrast. What, what do you think? Yeah, um, there's a lot there. Um, the hemisphere thing touches a lot of nerves. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was a lot of places. Um, where to even begin with it? So yeah, the left brain, right brain thing. Um, Marshall had a couple, he had a lot of dichotomies, right? A lot of pairing of things. Um, one of the major ones, uh, categories was acoustic and visual space. Mm -hmm. So, um, acoustic space, uh, visual space is, is perspective in the single, single point of view. It's the linear, it's the, uh, sequential, it's, uh, the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, one, two, three, four, um, it's uh, the film, film, it's all these things. Um, and it is um, left brain, mm -hmm. right-handed stuff, um, it, dialectic, logic. Um, this was the world that was brought into being, uh, according to Marshall, um, thanks to things like the phonetic alphabet, which um, broke us from this tribal trance we were in and um, for the first time allowed us to separate sound uh, and sense and, you know, the alphabet fragmented things and broke things apart. And this started um, a trend that will continue. This was the birth of what they called literacy, mm -hmm. which ended basically with electricity. Um, acoustic space, so uh, visual space, it's the, the space, the perception of space as experienced by the eye. So the eye, you know, we see straight ahead and we generally focus on one thing at a time. Uh, acoustic space, on the other hand, uh, the world of the ear is what he called a resonance sphere. So it's 360 degrees. Um, you hear from all directions uh, and it's simultaneous as opposed to sequential. So everything happens at once. Um, it's nonlinear. Uh, so it doesn't operate the way the eye does. Uh, and this sort of thing. And it is the mode um, before literacy uh, and, you know, more like the mode post-literacy. So, sorry, I have a child knocking at my door. <laughs> Go Hang on a second. Thank you. Do you want to be in? Okay, so you got to be quiet, all right? I am all right, hang on. All right. Sorry, my, my eldest Ezra came to say hi. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. So I'm talking about Papa and Granddad's books and stuff. Cool. Ezra, Ezra recently got famous because um, I just published a book of poetry mm -hmm. called Written Matter. And in it, um, the frontispiece is a poem that Ezra, he didn't write, but he said it when he was three years old. Um, which really impressed me. So, so I put it in there. Um, Ezra, as you can imagine, is named after Ezra Pound because I'm a McLuhan. So what are you going to do? Uh, our youngest is Virgil, oh. another poet. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well. So, um, uh, so visual and acoustic space are, are major categories. And um, Marshall gets a lot of these ideas um, an important work is uh, by, so you've gone into Julian Jaynes. Did you get into Havelock? Uh, no, I've just focused on Julian Jaynes, you okay. know, thanks to Brian McQuay, uh, who's here too. So, okay. yes, go ahead. So, so next on your list could be, should be Eric Havelock and his book, Preface to Plato. Mm -hmm. This is important, uh, was important to Marshall because Preface to Plato talks about um, the pre-literate world um, and the world which came into being uh, with the alphabet. Um, and this is important to us in post-literacy, not because post-literacy means a return to pre-literacy mm -hmm. um, because there's no going back, there's only going forward, but insight into the pre-literate mind can give us some indication of what might come about uh, for the post-literate mind. And um, so pre-literacy was all about the verbal transmission of information um, from mouth to ear, 
So acoustic space, the world experienced by the ear versus visual space, the world experienced by the eye. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ezra, can you give us a few minutes? Thank you. Say bye. 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 Yeah. Is cold in here? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, Preface to Plato is a, is a very important book. Um, I'm sure Mark, Mark would tell you all about it. Uh, as well and you'll have to reset because that was a little bit distracting for me oh no 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 problem at all no problem okay. at all. so we, we were talking about you're talking about the the visual space and the acoustic space and the difference between them and we we're talking about the difference between methods that allow you to okay. have perspective on your current situation versus mm -hmm. uh just going with whatever was there in yeah. the previous generation all right, so this was a, another another thing I wanted to mention about Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. Poe is credited with uh, the invention of the detective in fiction, okay? Um, and he created a character called uh, Dupin. Um, and Marshall likened his uh, method, um, and he talked about methods more than theories. He talked about it uh, as uh, being the detective method. and. He said, uh, I begin with effects and I work back to causes. So um, in, the, in the typical detective novel, you, you generally start with uh, the effect with a body. And then the rest of the book is piecing together these clues, which don't come in any logical sequence. They come from here and there and everywhere. And you have to put them together to create this picture, this environment, which created this effect, right? Um, this comes back to, or it introduces the idea of causation and formal cause, mm -hmm. which is also very central to McLuhan work because, um, again, with dialectic and visual and acoustic and everything, um, another way to, to think about formal cause is to call it environmental cause mm -hmm. uh, versus um, our general understanding of cause, which we call cause and effect. And that is, you know, a leads to B, leads to C, leads to D. And you can see how this grew from the alphabet. Mm -hmm. um, now in a, in a post alphabet kind of environment, you know, obviously we still have the alphabet. Um, we still have books, but um, the role has changed. You know, the book doesn't reign supreme. The newspaper doesn't reign supreme. We don't go to the newspaper for news. You know, we go to it for analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the environment is totally changed um, and that changes everything, of course. Um, so it's this, you know, one of the one of the keys to understanding Marshall's methods is that it's always an environmental approach. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. OK, so I mean, this is just so, so amazing that I have so many, so many interesting leads. Let's start with artist. OK, role of artist mm -hmm. in helping us yeah. see what is going on. What, what, what do artists at their best do? Um, they generally don't do what they think they're doing. <laughs> this is the thing. So um, Marshall gets a lot of his ideas about art and the utility of the artist from Wyndham Lewis mm -hmm. uh, and from Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound actually in ABC of Reading said the artist is the antenna of the race. Mm -hmm. uh, Marshall talks about the distant early warning line and the artist as a distant early warning line. So the reason why the arts are useful, why the artist is useful, is because the artist, and you know, there's kind of a capital A artist insinuated there. Mm -hmm. The artist is the person in society who is always sharpening their perceptive faculties. Mm -hmm. So they're always trying to experience new things in new ways and to tell us about it, right? Um, they're, they're doing this really great work. Um, and because Marshall realized that the, uh, the drivers of change in society are technologies, when the artist is picking up on changes, the artist is picking up on the early effects of technologies on what technologies are doing. Mm -hmm. So Marshall learned to pay attention to the arts for that reason. And 
the difficult thing is how do you know what's uh, what's reliable, <laughs> you know, what's actual news in the artist term and what's not. And the way I think about it is um, generally it's it's what makes you uncomfortable and what looks strange mm -hmm. and uh, unfamiliar, right? Like um, it's funny to think that uh, Elvis was at one time shocking, mm -hmm. right? But he was, yep. and um, it's a sure sign that uh, things have moved on when the new music or the new art or something um, is that offensive to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the artist is the antenna of the race means that it's the artist that's out there with his feelers, um, you know, trying to experience things anew uh, and to tell us about it. And that's, um, that's why Marshall leans so heavily on them. Now the genius, the thing that Marshall, Marshall was able, uh, like it's one thing to be able to say that it's another thing to actually make any use of it mm -hmm. you know it's okay so I'm confronted by this piece of artwork it's uh, it's dead ugly it makes me uncomfortable I think it's awful uh, I think it's offensive what is that telling me you know and that's another question that I wish we had Marshall here to answer <laughs> well, um, I want to now turn to laws of media because oh. for me, um, the, you know, you, you talked about him, Marshall, thinking about methods rather than theories. Um, you talked about him using that method on anything. Like, you know, he's being kind of open to all human artifacts, everything that the human beings are doing. He's bringing to bear this multi-perspective approach to bear on anything that he's looking at, instead of going kind of linear, mm. um, it captures, so, so to me, like Tetrad captures all of that in that single tool. So yeah. can you tell people a little bit about what Tetrads are and yeah. what role they played in Marshall's and Eric's thinking? Sure. Um, the Tetrad is kind of the Swiss army knife of McLuhan work. So, um, you know, I'm a craftsman. Uh, I, I run a small business doing furniture upholstery, although I have less and less time for that these days as I'm doing more stuff like this uh, and teaching and whatnot. But um, maybe as a consequence of that, I'm interested in tools. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and coming back to why I started the McLuhan Institute, um, I started it because uh, now more than ever, we need tools for understanding technologies. Um, you know, we're getting further and further. The thing about this maelstrom mm -hmm. is that the further we get down, the faster it goes, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, need, we need help. And Marshall devoted his life and career to finding ways to look at and understand technologies. So what interests me most um, and what I've kind of dedicated myself to through the McLuhan Institute is pulling out of the work um, these tools, um, things that are useful for uh, understanding technology and its effects on culture and people today and tomorrow. Uh, we don't need more museums. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's great to look at what Marshall did with stuff back then, but that's much less important to me than what we can do with it today. So that's where I focus on. Mm -hmm. Um, laws of media is great because um, that's essentially where it comes from. Mm -hmm. So Marshall, Marshall wrote Understanding Media. Uh, Marshall, okay, Understanding Media was published in 1964. It was actually the second stage of a project which Marshall started in 1958. Um, he was hired by the NAEB, National Association of Educational Broadcasters, to develop a curriculum for high school students for studying uh, new media. Uh, understanding uh, the project in understanding new media um, is, is what he undertook there. Uh, a couple years later, he revised it, came back, revised it more and more and more and more and more, and turned this report into this book, um, Understanding Media. This is the copy he gave to, to Eric McLuhan in 1964. Actually, interestingly enough, um, people don't ask the question, but there's a relation between these two books. This is Understanding Poetry by Brooks and Warren. 
which came out in 1961. And this is Understanding Media by Marshall McLuhan in 1964. And there's a relation. Um, in the dedication of this, Marshall writes, for Eric, Christmas 1961, from mother and dad, Clint Brooks, a longstanding friend of mine, did revolutionize the teaching of literature in the USA with this book. Clint Brooks also studied with Richards and Leibis in Practical Criticism. And this is Practical Criticism Applied to Poetry. And this is Practical Criticism Applied to Technology and Culture, Wider Culture. There's an interesting parallel between those two books. But anyway, um, dad, my dad, Eric, started working with Marshall in the mid 60s. He ended up going with him to Fordham University, 67, 68. And he was with Marshall in the early 70s when the publisher of Understanding Media said, we're coming up to the 10th anniversary and let's do a 10th anniversary edition. Maybe you can write a new introduction or something. Well, um, Marshall saw this as an opportunity to revisit some of the criticisms that Understanding Media faced. And chief among them was the fact that, um, you know, that's all good and well, but what can we do with it, you know? Um, and this got Marshall to thinking, well, um, he took this as a challenge to, to answer uh, scientific statements about uh, media, about technology and technological environments. And um, so he decided, well, what, what general statements can we make about technologies, about all technologies? What do all technologies, not just these technologies and those, but every technology do, general statements. Um, so this began a project they called UMR, Understanding Media Revised, um, which started as a revision of Understanding Media, but led into this other work. Um, it was rejected by the publisher because it was way more than they wanted. But so um, Marshall and Eric uh, first started by um, going through Understanding Media and, and seeing what was in there that they could use. And um, they found, they found a few things, but this was the criteria that um, it had to apply in all cases. It had to be a statement you could make about a fork as much as you could make about the telephone or the computer or anything else. It had to apply across the board. And so they, the significant, a significant part here was that they broadened this idea of what a medium was. Um, because most people, when you talk about media, they think communications media. And um, here they're broadening it to everything human beings do or create, right? All innovation is fair game. So they went through understanding media and they found uh, the first three of what was eventually four laws. And that was um, that all media enhance uh, or amplify some function. Um, that they uh, obsolesce another, that is that they take over from, from something else and push it back and give it a different role. Um, and that, uh, now forgive me if I don't get the exact order, but the four things are enhance, obsolesce, that um, when you push something uh, to its limits, uh, as far as it can go, that it, it tends to reverse or flip its characteristics. And finally, that um, it retrieves something that had been obsolesced uh, previously. Now it's important to note that, you know, I, I listed them in an order, but um, coming back to visual versus acoustic space, um, one of the important things that they learned about the laws of media and the tetrad is that they're not sequential, but they're simultaneous. And they didn't figure this out right away because if you look at the early laws of media material, the first published material in the seventies, Marshall was listing them as A, B, C, D. Uh, and they got, a, they got away from that because- Sorry, what was the order in which he was listing it in the, in the early phases? Uh, I, I think it was enhance, obsolesce, reverse, retrieve. Okay. Yeah, um, E-F-R-O. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, they, they realized that this was part of, part of the bias of visual culture um, and that it, it got in the way or it limit, at least it limited uh, your perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And they were all about opening it up. So mm -hmm. they moved away from this um, ABCD representation to a graphic format where um, it was more representative of 
uh, acoustic space, I guess. And they would also sometimes change up the order because there are like eight different combinations that you can use to maintain the balance between the parts. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, uh, UMR led to LOM or laws of media, which was uh, in the early days, it was actually, uh, they called it the visual space essay. Um, and they shopped it around to various people. Uh, but uh, Marshall died before it would be published. Um, and the project kind of lay fallow for a while. Um, well, uh, Marshall died New Year's Eve, 1980. Eric, uh, and it was quite sudden, he was only 69 years old, keep in mind, which, which isn't very old. Um, but uh, Eric kind of kept on going um, in, his, in his own studies. And uh, he published Laws of Media in 1988, uh, University of Toronto Press. And um, that was his first major McLuhan work. And this was something that he and Marshall um, undertook together. Um, there's a, uh, let me show you this. This is something I treasure. This is a picture of uh, Marshall and Eric McLuhan. Oh, wow. Yeah, Marshall, the English professor mm -hmm. with it, little Eric in short pants <laughs> and like a suit coat. Very much the 1950s English professor and his son, right? Yes. Um, Eric was, my father was the first born, then there were four girls, and then my uncle Michael, who's the youngest. And um, But dad was ever raised kind of to be the professor's son, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the culture he grew up in, and that's the way it happened. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that Marshall read a lot. Well, I mean, that's really an understatement. He was always reading and thinking and working, and... Um, it didn't really, I, I guess we would say today, he wasn't very present as a father, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at all. My grandmother, Corinne, carried much of that weight. Uh, my father spent a lot of time with Marshall only because he went to work with him, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that I worked with my father and the way that Marshall worked, uh, Eric worked with his father, very different things. Dad um, totally. Um, went down the academic route uh, and became not just uh, an understudy, but uh, a collaborator and a co-author and a co-discoverer. He and Marshall discovered the laws of media together and worked on them. And the book Laws of Media uh, is thanks to dad, you know, mm -hmm. basically. Dad also did a lot of things behind the scenes, editing and polishing and, and things for Marshall. And um, you know, so there is, there is a real relationship there and the, the Tetrad is, is their discovery. There's, there's lots more to say about the Tetrad. Um, another, another distinction about it is that, uh, it's only useful for examining human artifacts. Mm -hmm. And this is an important point. And a lot of people will from time to time try to, try to get around that, but, but it holds because, um, humans, you know, we do like to think a lot of ourselves, but mm -hmm. but we're we're different in what we do from animals because sure, animals develop technologies, right? Mm -hmm. Beavers make beaver dams, and spiders make spider webs, and birds make nests, but they don't behave the same way. Mm -hmm. For example, um, while a beaver dam might enhance a beaver's ability to contain its environment and to catch fish, mm -hmm. what does it obsolesce? Well, maybe it obsolesces the old way of catching fish where it was a little more difficult. But um, when you push it to an extreme, what does a beaver dam do? Mm -hmm. What does a beaver dam retrieve for the beaver from its past? I don't think these are questions we can answer, right. um, but I, I don't think they're questions there are really answers to. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is an important distinction about um, the Tetrad and about human technologies um, is that they're they're different. No, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I was completely, I'm completely blown away by, by Tetrads yeah. because it's such a, I mean, I think the primary use of it is not to get stuck in the way in which you've been thinking. Yeah. Because just by having those four things uh, to bring to bear, yeah. it forces you to just say, okay, 
what is what are the perspectives that are missing? Um, so it's, there, there are a few more things about tetrads. Please. Um, they're they're a tool. They're meant to be used. Um, they're also difficult. Uh, they're very challenging, and they require they require a lot of you. They're good when done in teams, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest challenge I have in tetrads is with uh, the retrieve portion. Mm -hmm. Because in order to know what um, any technology brings back from the past, you need to know a lot about the past. Yes. You know? I mean, it seems pretty obvious, but uh, it's it's not. So um, there's actually uh, something called media archaeology mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, the Tetrad maker's greatest tool for the retrieval portion. Uh, because these are people that study the past of technology. So, um, you know, pay attention to that and you'll hear about, uh, you know, uh, ancient uh, Inca method of knotting ropes to communicate, you know, which which you might find comes back uh, somewhere else. Yeah, no, uh, I, th I think, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. Okay, um, the, other, the other parts are kind of intellectual exercises of imagination imagining this is the great thing about the tetrad is um it's it's a tool that you can use to imagine what will be the effects of technologies um so in terms of thinking things out before we put them out mm -hmm. the tetrad is a very valuable tool because um you know i'm a, i'm a poet i'm a writer mm -hmm. and uh, for any creative person even a painter um you're confronted with the blank page or the empty canvas and where do you start right mm -hmm. and this is the great thing about the tetrad is that it doesn't tell you everything about a technology but it gives you a pretty solid start right and um so often you know what is it? the journey of a thousand steps begins with one you know it's it gets it gets you going and it can and it can lead you interesting places um so uh so the tetrad is is a tool and it's as useful as you make it and it takes a long time it takes use you know at, again as a craftsman i come back to this but um you don't you don't get an expert at whittling sticks the first time you pick one up right it takes a long time to learn how to use that carving knife um you have your body has to learn how to hold the thing you have to learn not to cut yourself. I'm not sure that really applies, but uh, you, you get what I mean. Um, don't expect instant answers, instant expertise. Um, and what I learned from my dad, because I found his tetrads all over the place, is um, you know, you, you start one, uh, you come back to it. Um, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you realize, oh, yeah, that retrieves that, or that, you know, obsolesce that, or um, you know, thing you fill in the parts here and there. Uh, and the other thing is that um, don't get caught in this trap of one right answer, mm -hmm. you know, um, because there are often multiple things that can be said. Um, on the other hand, uh, another part of the tetrad, which is something I you know, I'm still learning these things, right? I think I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm not the expert on any of this stuff. I'm still figuring it out. But um, another part of the Tetrad, a more advanced part, is the structure mm -hmm. uh, of the four parts. And they, they act um, in a harmony, right? And uh, this, is, this is why there, there are specific ways of laying them out because they, they operate in a proportion and that proportion is A is to B as C is to D. Mm -hmm. Enhances to obsolesce as reverses to retrieve. Mm -hmm. And um, this can be a useful tool uh, because if you think of it like a poem, you're looking at rhyming pairs, rhyming couplets. Mm -hmm. And so if you know, um, uh, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, uh, you you get a hang, an inkling that I'm looking for something that rhymes with red. I'm looking for something that rhymes with blue, you know, and so there there's resonance uh, among the parts in seeking like the perfect 
uh, tetrad. And that's something that that developed later as well. Um, and uh, as I, I'm, I hesitated to mention it because you'll probably call me on it and I won't be able to explain it very well. But, um, you know, a lot of this, um, you have, you can wonder if this is all a bit self-fulfilling for Marshall, considering that he was uh, into poetry. Mm -hmm. So of course, all his work would end up being geared that poetry is the answer to everything, mm -hmm. uh, kind of. Um, and I don't know, make of it, make of it what you will. But um, for me, the proof is in the pudding and uh, and it's what we can do with these things. Uh, the tetrad isn't the only tool either. Um, you know, you say you have an interest in psychology, figuring mm -hmm. around uh, in we'll gestalt see. psychology yeah. um, is a much, uh, is a simpler and, and very like, look, it's a very powerful tool, figuring ground. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's something, something that I teach and I teach it to, to children as young as my son huh. uh, and to people, you know, of all ages. Um, and what it is, is Marshall talked a lot about the invisibility of environments, right? How the technologies, uh, environments are invisible, especially to us with our, our linear perspectives. Um, and he used these terms figure and ground, which he co-opted from Gestalt psychology from Edgar Rubin around 1915, who used them to describe the structure of visible phenomena. Marshall used them to describe the structure of invisible phenomena, the effects of technologies, which are a lot more slippery. Um, and the way that, that I run this is you pick a figure, the easiest thing for me to do, especially with the kids is a cell phone. You pick up the mm -hmm. phone and you say, um, you know, first I, I go into a little bit what the terms figure and ground mean, right? And the figure is the object of attention. The ground is inattention, is everything else. So um, we're used to using the terms uh, regarding painting and that, you know, foreground and background. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the structure we're talking about, it goes beyond the canvas and takes in the gallery wall and it takes in the gallery and it takes in art history and it takes in the art industry, and it takes in the artist, and it takes in paints and brushes and chalk and canvas and all these things. This is the ground. So um, I, I say to, I say to, and mm -hmm. what you want to do is um, you want the biggest board you can get, whiteboard, blackboard, whatever, mm -hmm. um, because it's really, the thing about an environment is it's difficult to hold a picture of this in your mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not built that way. So uh, it's good to have a surface to, to, to map it out on. So I put the figure in the middle and I say to the kids or whoever, now, what do you need in order for uh, the smartphone to operate, to, to be useful in society? And this is where we start from. Wow. And so uh, your role as the intermediary is to map these things out. So it's great with a group, especially of kids, because everybody can answer that question. You need electricity, so you need power lines, and you need component parts, and you need manufacturing, and you need money, and you need education, and you need apps, and you need cords, and you need all these things. You need batteries, you need rare earth minerals. Oh, you need workers. Oh, you need slave labor in China. Oh, you need all these things. And you map these things out on the board, um, and you start to, to group things together and you see how categories interrelate and speak to each other and rely upon each other. And you can do this for half an hour. You can do it for an hour with something like the smartphone, but you can use any technology. And you get a big board full of all these things that map out this ground, this service environment of, of your figure. But that's not the whole equation, is it? Because in, in technology, Marshall broke this down into personal and social effects, right? And the social effects, the environment uh, is one thing, but the personal, the psychological effects are another, right? And how do you get at that? So uh, this is really fun with the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm old when I say that, but with the kids. So once we get a big board full and everybody's been having a good time and um, I say, okay, now, Imagine you wake up tomorrow and your smartphone doesn't work and it's never going to work again. And they go, <gasps> because they can't, you know, they can't. Um, anybody under the age of 15 
has grown up in the world of the smartphone. It informs everything they do. They wake up in the morning and they look at it if it doesn't wake them up. It's the last thing they see when they go to bed. They have anxiety if it runs out of battery. They look everything up on it. They message their friends. When they go out to recess, their friends right beside them, but they're messaging them. They're checking TikTok. They're doing everything with these things. They're absolutely dependent on them. And the idea of not being able to have it for if they smash their screen for a day maybe is horror enough, but a world without the smartphone, what are you even talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot of us are older and we know that we used to do everything pretty well before the smartphone, we'd figure it out eventually. But the point is the shock would be total and instant. And when you erase that board, that's when you start to get the psychological and the deeper, more hidden environmental effects that are less obvious. It's when you take the figure out of the ground um, and therefore obliterate the ground that you realize the subtle ways that these new technologies get into everything and everything becomes dependent on them. So figuring ground is as powerful, if not uh, equally powerful uh, an analytical tool as the tetrad. The tetrad gets a lot of press maybe, but figuring ground is a really solid and deceivingly simple but complex McLuhan tool. Absolutely, That's, this is wonderful. Um, so uh, Andrew, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have uh, small groups where we can talk more about your ideas in a free flowing way, and then we'll come back so people will get to ask you questions. Folks, sure. I'm going to start the breakout rooms now. Breakout rooms will run for 20 minutes. As always, the rules are let everybody speak for about a couple of minutes on what they got from the presentation. Have a discussion. Rules, uh, keep on topic, be brief, um, be, uh, you know, express yourself, uh, disagree with anything, but do so courteously. And if you need help, uh, click on, uh, please help and I'll, I'll help you. Starting the breakout rooms now, we'll be back here in 20 minutes. So Andrew, you'll be in one of the breakout rooms. See you there. Okay. I am in breakout room. Okay. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Hello. I love the Hollywood Squares thing, you know. Folks, I'm going can... to be quiet so you guys can go ahead and first start with you know, two, two minutes of, about what, what, what you got so far. And you can ask any questions of uh, Andrew and go for, go for it. Well, can you excuse me for a minute so I can just take a, a bathroom break? Please, can? please do. Please do. Okay. I'll be right Hi, Karen. Nice to see you. It's oh, thank you. I'm so it's glad nice. to be here. Yes, for those who have not seen this, there is an incredible meetup Karen did on art experience. I still remember it. It's about integration of individual and society, which is just simply brilliant. Thank is it you. on your? Is it on YouTube? Um, oh yeah, yes. it's on Comprehensive yes. Wednesdays. It's yeah. a... Oh wait, I've been to almost all the Comprehensive Wednesdays. I must have missed that one. This was this was earlier before. Ah, this is before Maritza. All right, oh. I'll check it out. <laughs> Wonderful. This is this is so good. I I, I just oh, this is good. So much. He and has covered so many different thoughts within, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but um, I couldn't just stop listening and all connections going all directions. Yeah, no, it's is very, very good. And this is a very deep topic. Very deep. And you can see that his approach has legs. And it is very much scalable. It, it should, like I was watching McLuhan talk, Marshall McLuhan talk in 1960s <clears> about <throat> what is going on with, with computers. You know, this is the 1960s. And if you say, wait a minute, is he talking about now? But right. It, it's that good, but he's able to see forward. Um, so it's just, just incredible, incredible stuff. That's the amazing thing is that he came up with these universal kinds of approaches where I, I love the where he said uh you know it has to apply to a fork the same way it would apply to uh another area of technology it had to be like kind of universal 
And that when you can extract those kinds of generalized principles and apply them, that's very powerful because that means what you say in 1960 will apply in 2020. And, and because you're able to articulate like a framework of really evaluating what something is. That was what was striking to me was the reminder that he wasn't writing about the future because when you, when you read his right. stuff, it, it's hard to re remember that because it seems so applicable in today's world that you forget that he was not writing about our present. He was writing about his present and so it's just amazing that it's so pertinent now. Yeah, his, his main point is that most of us are living in the past. That right. everything that we are expecting, everything that we are thinking about is actually just of the past. And what he's saying is that you need to have developed sensibility to hear what is going on or see what is going on in our current times. We are actually blind to it. We're just going with what, what we have from the past because that's how we grew up. And he's, this idea of ground is a very deep idea of saying that you build these kind of way of functioning. You, know, you have a certain sensibility that you learned as a kid and you're carrying it with you. And that had, has some kind of technology behind it. Welcome back, Andrew. All right, so folks, we can just go around um, and just uh, tell for about uh, two minutes what you got from the uh, presentation and you can put a question on the table if you want. So who'd like to go first? Just go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, so- um, Let, let I, me just introduce Brian. Uh, Brian McVeigh is a scholar on Julian Jaynes. He has written about 17 books. Oh, wow. Julian Jaynes, he was a student of Julian Jaynes. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so I actually, this is really very exciting for me and I wanna thank you, uh, Andrew. I, I really feel like I've learned a lot. Um, it's really sparked an interest in me to go back and look at um, some of these works that I went through when I was a grad student, but I really haven't been paying as much attention to them as I should. But my question is um, this idea of the, the role of technology in altering, changing, modifying uh, the human condition and this uh, charge that uh, I've heard sometimes uh, of uh, technological determinism. And uh, I was wondering if you could just comment on that, uh, what, what, what your response would be if someone said, basically what we're talking about is technological determinism. Uh, so what, Brian, what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect all the questions. We will try to see if you have time here for the questions because I want to do both takeaways and questions. Otherwise we will do the questions when, once we come back to the okay. main. All right, who'd like to go next? Rupali. I could go next. Um, <clears throat> it's a very fascinating talk. Thank you very much, Andrew. And um, I wanted to ask you about poetry and um, what its role is for children. Okay, role of poetry for children. So I'm going to collect all the questions for now and we will we'll come back to as many as possible. Who would like to go next? Um, my, my question would have been similarly veined as uh, Rupali's. I'm fascinated by the, the idea that, um, you know, poetry is the answer to everything. I'm wondering if it was poetry specifically, or was it more um, generally art? And I'd love to hear um, you expand upon that. Okay. Uh, uh, Joe. I mean, I have somewhat of a similar question, and this is going to sound very basic, but the idea of practical criticism and how it was applied to comics specifically to begin with. You know, what was the choice? What, how, why did you choose comics? And then how that related to technology, then how they made the jump from comics to technology. That was interesting. Wonderful, Karen or John? Yeah, so I, don't know, I guess I, I'll give a takeaway. Although I do have questions. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I was just, I really enjoyed hearing about um, his early life and his upbringing. Um, I just thought, it's really interesting to see how people who I only really know through sort of a narrow lens of their what work they put out, or in this case, like a very small amount of work they put out, um, or, or that I have read, not of course he's put out a lot of work, but just to sort of think about, okay, well, you know, he grew up on the, on the uh, you know, in Canada, in, in sort of like a rural environment, 
and you know something about the planes and i was sort of recalling how like uh you know bob dylan was uh, brought up on the planes too and he had some quote around about how sort of uh the the you know, the North is sort of, the cold is a great equalizer. Um, it sort of makes you think because it sort of takes away all that sense of re rebelliousness and makes you sort of observe things because you're sort of just dealing with being out in the cold. Uh, also, I was I was sort of struck by the fact that he liked sailing. And um, I thought it was really interesting that he really liked sailing, yet he, he sort of like this, known for his, his sort of technological, uh, you know, uh, analytical brilliance and but i was just thinking also too about how sailing sort of was the first internet in a way i mean it was the first really thing that really connected the world albeit at a slower speed but I, I was just i guess that would be my question is what affected sailing it, it seems a little bit counterintuitive at first that sailing this thing that's sort of such an ancient practice would be the you know uh, uh, a childhood enjoyment of a man who you know is basically known for being able to predict you know, i don't want to say predict the future because that's not what he's doing right according to him but to be able to know really what's going on in a modern age so well to be able to sense it um is there any connection there is there any was it was it simply just a a sort of nice reprieve from that or was it something where he had a deeper connection wonderful uh karen um, I really loved the uh, what you said about the difference between, well, the theory that he he doesn't work with theories, um, and that he works from observation. And it occurred to me this, uh, you know, you had mentioned how we're living in the past, uh, because um, it, it started to think that each each individual really imitates and originates, you know like we, we have these two sides that we imitate and originate. And the way we've been trained in school, in education, and now with um, this, this, um, this technology, these cell phones and things, we are so much just building on previous theories. You know, we're, we're like learning what other people have thought. And um, I, that was where we're not really um, trained right. to originate. Um, and to ob observe and come up, start with effects and go back to the cause. So that gave me a lot to think about. Wonderful, thank you, Karen. So it looks like there are lots of people who have questions on poetry. So how about we start with, with that and then we can see how much, you know, we can just run the discussion and everything else, we can ask all the other questions in the, in the main room. Cool. So um, Carrie, that, that actually comes, comes back to poetry um, because how do, how do we do anything new, you know? Uh, and uh, forgive me if I don't get all the names, but poetry, poetry for children, um, it teaches them to experiment, you know, and to, and to seek novelty. Um, I, I mentioned about my book of poetry here, when Ezra, who came through, was three years old, um, he was sitting on my knee after bath time, and he said this to me, okay, and three years old. He said, I hurt my angels, and my angels got tangled in five angles. What? <laughs> really? Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't ask him what it meant. I just let him roll with it, and I just committed it to memory and then wrote it down as fast as I could. And I asked his permission um, to publish it at the head of this collection of poetry. Um, and because this is the way I grew up, playing and experimenting with language. Again, okay. language, we learn so much from language. Language has so much to teach us. Um, and one thing is everything. You learn to experiment and to play with language. Um, you learn to experiment and pl play with other things. And this was. Um, what Marshall was doing, he said, I don't explain, I explore. He said that in 1965. He said, um, I don't have concepts, only percepts. You know, uh, again, to the same thing. Um, art versus poetry. So like visual art versus poetry. Um, I, again, this comes down to, to language and the utility of language. 
uh, different arts have have different things, different they're different ways of experiencing, the different ways of telling. Um, so it's it's one thing. Uh, I've learned this when I've tried to teach that it's one thing to understand something yourself. It's quite another thing to try and help somebody else understand it, to try and explain it, right? Very different things. And you find it very quickly how much you actually know when you try to explain it to somebody else. Or, you know, I, I've learned not to try to explain too much because um, you can't really explain something to anybody else. You can only help them to understand, you know? Uh, I, I don't think explanation is all that helpful. I think it's easier. I prefer show and tell, you know, that's why I use a lot of exhibits and Marshall's own words, because um, as I said, the further down you, you get, the more broken the telephone gets, right? It's uh, your understanding will be a lot more pure for yourself if you arrive at it unaided. Um, um, it's neat that you brought up sailing. Uh, Marshall, when he was at Cambridge, uh, one of the things that I have here is a 12 foot oar, um, which Marshall brought back from Cambridge. He was on the rowing team at, uh, for Trinity College, Cambridge University. And um, every year Cambridge and Oxford have a series of sports competitions and one of them is rowing. It's a famous thing. Uh, an ancient rivalry, ancient and modern. And uh, the deal at Cambridge anyway, is if your team, if your boat wins, you get to keep your oar. So um, I have it here. It says H.M. McLuhan, uh, seat three, 1936. Uh, and it's a beautiful giant thing hanging back there. Marshall was very athletic. He was six foot one. He was, he was a, a fairly big guy. He's, athletic. He's kind of built. Um, he liked to have a good time. He played hockey as a kid. He was on, on teams. Um, sailing uh, is, you know, actually a, a very physical, especially when it's a one-man boat. It's a very physical thing. Uh, it takes a lot from you. Um, and you have to be careful. You can get knocked out and you can drown and, you know, it's, it's not a game. Um, so Marshall always had uh, an interest in athletics um, and, you know, as a lot of people do when they go to school, you know, people join whatever teams and that, and Marshall was, was no exception there. Um, and I, I see a relation here between my work and my workshop. I have a workshop next door where I work on furniture. Um, and physical activity is a great way to exercise your body, to let your mind rest and to let your mind work. Right. Mm. Um, the, the way things, as I said, the way I worked with my dad was different from the way he worked with his dad. Um, they worked very closely together. I've always had to work as a living. O only for a small period of time when I was inventorying Marshall's books um, did I ever, was I ever subsidized really for the work because um, we had a small grant that paid for me for the year and a half that I did it. It didn't pay me a lot, but it helped. Um, so the way it would work is I have my workshop in the big barn next door and dad has his workshop here. Um, and we would talk and, you know, he'd explain things and I'd get to a point where, you know, cause I'd need to walk away from it. Cause okay, I've got enough to think of, I need to chew it over, right? So I'd go next door and work on my furniture. And while I'm busy with my hands, my mind is busy, right? Um, so there's, there's a relation there. Uh, and I think, uh, any runners know this because runners do a lot of this stuff and, and most people who, who do physical activity, you know, your mind wanders and it's actually the wandering mind is a wonderful thing. A lot happens when your mind wanders and uh, I encourage my children to let their mind wander uh, because you end up in the most wonderful and ex uh, beautiful places. Um, technological determinism. So um, I'll, I'll throw the question back to you for a second. And what do you mean by technological determinism? Well, this, uh, the, to put it simply, this idea that in order to understand historical change, we don't really have to rely on economics or political uh, structures, uh, that basically uh, the simplest way to understand 
what we are as a species and where we are historically is just by pointing to some sort of technology. Uh, and, you know, the technology could be anything. And I, I suppose, you know, we could broaden the definition of technology, it's technique, for example, agricultural revolution, and then perhaps writing. Um, yep. uh, in any case, uh, you know, when people hear the word technology, of course, they always assume it's something sophisticated or electronic, but that, as yeah. you know, that's not necessarily the case. Oh, for sure. Uh, I bring this up all the time. Um, you know, writing is, is a very sophisticated technology. Uh, the book is a very sophisticated technology and uh, marginalia annotation are very significant uh, innovations and sophisticated innovations uh, not to be underestimated. I've certainly learned the value of them myself sitting here in an annotated library. It's a way I can keep in conversation with my father and grandfather and keep learning from them even though they're somewhere else, you know, they're still very much here. Um, so people throw at this term technological determinism as a bit of a, a slur, like, uh, right. you know, That's right. and I don't really understand that myself. Um, Marshall is very much saying that the major technologies are the major shaping influences in, in human, uh, humans and human society. Um, it's, you know, really an, an undeniable uh, fact of the matter. Um, you know, uh, Marshall would say, uh, society has always been shaped. Oh, why did I just get a pop up here? Society has always been shaped more by the means of communication than by the, the uses of communication. Um, and this is easily easy to demonstrate. I mean, Zoom, Zoom, for example, has uh, become very, very, very important in our society, especially in the last year. Um, these kind of discussions. And does it really matter that we're talking about Marsha McLuhan or we could have been talking about our postage stamp collections? Uh, the effect is the same, you know? And if that's uh, technological determinism, uh, then yeah, sure, we're technological determinists because uh, that's definitely what's driving the bus more than, than we are. Okay, thanks. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. So we got about 60 minutes, uh, 60 seconds before we automatically come back to oh. the room. So this is this is magic. You know, it's like it's wonderful to have, you know, kind of divided into small groups, have a conversation like this cool. and then come back. So uh, when we go back into the main room, uh, other people will have questions. So we'll just do questions and takeaways and wrap up. How, how are you doing on time? I'm fine. Okay. Very good. Yep. Very good. Wonderful. So we'll be there in about 20 seconds. I'm going to leave, cool. go to the main room and just in case somebody got there earlier and it's confused. Okay. But I'll, I'll leave you folks. See you in 18 seconds. back. Welcome back, folks. So it's time for quick takeaways followed by questions, mostly questions. So if you have questions, uh, go ahead and type uh, exclamation mark in chat. First come, first served. Um, the uh, keep on topic, be brief. Feel free to disagree, but do so courteously. And at this point, mostly questions. Um, you can make very quick takeaways, maybe uh, one to four sentences, and then questions. Uh, uh, can't, I'll just I'll just say quickly, um, just to reiterate, if people want a copy of the audio autobiography, um, they can email me Andrew at the McLuhaninstitute.com. Also, um, it would be while you're at it. Um, I've got books like uh, The Interior Landscape, uh, First Editions, and um, various other McLuhan things. If you go to the McLuhaninstitute.com, there's a shop tab, and it'll take you to the bookshop where we have all kinds of vintage McLuhan stuff that um, you can buy to support my work while you're at it.
Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Joe, could you do me a favor and go ahead and uh, put the URL in, in the chat? Thank you. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Um, all right, so it's going to be, let's see, it's going to be Karen followed by Joe first. Karen. Um, yeah, you used the, um, the expression early on, extension of body. Um, it, it, does that mean that the, uh, my, I heard a long time ago, um, I think it was Marshall McLuhan saying that the um, that the computer is an extension of the central nervous system. Uh, can you verify that or say anything more about that? Yep, um, that that comes a lot of places. Comes up a lot of places. Um, extensions of man, understanding media, the extensions of man, um, is the title of the book, and for good reason. Uh, here at the very beginning. He says, uh, because yeah, it's a, it's a persis persistent theme um, of this book that um, electricity is an extension of the central nervous system. Um, so electric technologies by extension. Here it says, uh, after 3000 years of explosion by means of fragmentary and mechanical technologies, the Western world is imploding. Uh, during the mechanical age, we had extended our bodies in space. Today, after more than a century of electric technology, we have extended our central nervous system itself in a global embrace. Um, and this idea of um, extensions of man uh, actually goes back a little further from Marshall. Ralph Waldo Emerson in 1870 said, the human body is the magazine of inventions, the patent office where are the models from which every hint was taken. All the tools and engines on earth are only extensions of its limbs and senses. Um, Marshall very directly appropriated that um, in his work uh, and simplified it to say extensions of man. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next up is going to be Joe, followed by Kevin. Joe. Uh, so briefly, I and thank you again for presenting this evening. Again, just one quick takeaway is the ground and the figure is a very, very powerful way of teaching, actually. I've even uh, used something similar to explain uh, infrastructure. Uh, when you have a blank piece of ground and infrastructure as a service as a cloud so that like how technology and actually they both can be developed it's a really interesting way of explaining things to people and clients but anyway um mine is goes back to the practical criticism question that i had in uh in the breakout room and then why they specifically had chosen to apply that to comics to begin with because of the, i think that's interesting in just one perspective is that there's a visual component to it and there's a written component to it and i was just wondering if there's a relationship between those and yep. then how did that relate to technology how did they then relate it to technology right so um that began when marshall came to his first teaching position in the states following cambridge and he was trying this was mid 1940s and he was trying to understand his students so he decided to look at the popular culture. And at that time, the popular culture was comics and it was advertising. Um, and uh, under, uh, sorry, The Mechanical Bride, the folklore of industrial man was an examination of advertising uh, before television. Um, and so that was that. How he made the leap, this is a very good question. Uh, how he made the leap from turning these techniques into wider uh, questions concerning technology. Um, you know, I think it just comes back to his experimental uh, question asking persistent kind of thing that he just, he tests things, right? It's like, oh, well, what if we can use um, this to look at that? And I think that's just kind of how it developed. Um, I can't say for sure, because I can't really think of, of where he commented on that. Um, although it's it's possible he was asked, there's so many McLuhan interviews out there. Um, if you're interested in figure and ground, um, he and my father Eric and Catherine Hutchin produced this book called um, City is Classroom, Understanding Language and Media. And this is where I, I get that figure and ground exercise from. This is all about, this is kind of another kick at the can of uh, teaching media to high school students. 
Um, and it's all about the training of perception and critical awareness. It's a, a really, really important book. Um, a lot of it is kind of outdated now because it's all about uh, television and stuff that's, you know, obviously past its best useful date. But the core principles underneath it about training perception are very, very useful. And as it happens, I do sell copies of it on the website. So feel free to reach out to me for that if you if you like. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Joe. you. Next up is Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. What's your question? Thank you, and you are like Mr. Michelle is born, was born in 1911. I, I wonder, can you share one story about his grandfather or parents' experience or especially about the media and its message? What kind of story from his grandparents or father? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Um, wow, his grandparents. I don't know a lot about Marshall's grandparents. I know more about his parents. Um, his mother, uh, Elsie Hall McLuhan, um, is really the, the prominent figure in that uh, because she was such a personality. His father um, was kind of an insurance salesman um, and uh, he was in World War I um, and he, he, was, he was very Irish. This is the Irish McLuhan. Um, so he was known for conversation. Uh, he liked to play the fiddle. Um, he was more interested in that kind of stuff than you know a, a great career or anything. Um, a lot has been made by commentators and, and biographers about you know the strength of Marshall's mother versus whatever weak father and stuff, which I don't know about that. Um, Herb. Old Herb is what they called him. Uh, Marshall's first name was Herbert, by the way, Herbert Marshall McLuhan, um, which gave him the wonderful initials of HMM, which I don't know if you can have better initials as a thinker. It's immediately contemplative. Hmm, you know? Uh, but medium is the message is something that I've, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that there are some touchstones when it comes to McLuhan and that's the global village. You know nothing of my work from Annie Hall and the medium is the message. Um, wh when I was thinking about what to do with the McLuhan Institute, I decided to focus a lot on the medium is the message because um, it's a deceptively simple as a lot of McLuhan stuff is, but, but very powerful thing. It's five words, the medium is the message. Yet they're so enduring um, and they have so much to teach which is interesting. So um, one thing I'm doing is um, I'm tracking down the first time Marshall said it and the last time Marshall said it and filling in everywhere in between to be able to plot a timeline. Um, because this phrase caught on so much that he said it hundreds of times in hundreds of different circumstances and all these different ways he used it are helpful in understanding what he meant. Um, so I tracked down the first time he said it and a lot of people, people who don't look too far, think it comes from Understanding Media in 1964 because the first chapter of Understanding Media is the medium is the message. But actually, um, Marshall was part of a radio broadcasters conference in 1958, in May of 1958, where he first said the medium is the message. And I have the transcript of that, um, which is a lot of fun. But the really interesting thing is digging up the story of how Marshall came to say it. Um, and that's kind of fun. And I give part of the credit to Sputnik. Sputnik was a, a satellite put up by Russia, USSR, in October 1957. And later, Marshall would make a lot of this event. Sputnik went around the world and created a proscenium arch. Uh, and this was the shift from the global village to the global theater in which we're all actors. And Sputnik, by making this proscenium arch, put us all on center stage. Um, he said, after Sputnik, ecological thinking became inevitable uh, because for the first time we saw our planet as an environment, as an ecosystem. And the interesting thing there is that six months later, Marshall says the medium is the message, which is an ecological statement because he's saying it's the environment that is the shaping influence, the totality of changes 
that are the message. Uh, so that's a little bit of fun with the medium is the message. Wonderful. So Andrew, thank you so much. I think this was just incredibly, <laughs> incredibly thought provoking. There's just so many, so many, so many things to, to follow up on and to, to think about. So really honored and thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Uh, I have put, folks, I have put the URL for the McLuhan Institute. Um, and you can contact um, Andrew at his email address. There is an email address on the website as well. All right. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>